The other night I woke up around three o'clock in the morning and I had a complete light bulb moment of why I was waking up in the middle of the night. Yeah, insomnia, yeah, perimenopause, yeah, all that, but it's pretty epic and I can't wait to share it with you on this podcast. The really super weird thing is that the next day I got an awesome email from Rosemary who wanted to know exactly about this. What's the deal with insomnia and perimenopause? Help! That's what this podcast is about. I hope you enjoy it. The Change Guru podcast is brought to you by my books, Be Your Own Change Guru and How to Find Your Purpose After 40. They're available on Amazon. And if you like the show, buying a book is an awesome way to show your support for what I'm doing. And now here's the podcast. The Change Guru. Listen up. You are the guru of your own Midlife change Gotta take it and own it Don't be restricted by age What's the number anyway? Live your dreams, don't hesitate You're the change guru You're the change guru This is the time to step up Make your dreams come true Whatever the change It all starts with you Whether it's life's purpose Relationships or career Whatever the change It's time to get what you want What you want What you really, really want Make a change in midlife And still look really hot Listen here, don't have fear You're the master of your fate You're the woman of the year I mean it, change your life forever I mean it, it's not too late, no never I said I mean it, change your life forever I mean it, it's not too late, no never Ever, 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 yeah The change guru All starts with you Everybody, welcome to TCG 2.0, episode number 24, how to deal with insomnia when you're going through perimenopause. Yay! I'm so glad you're here. It's Sue Paget, and you know, this Change Guru podcast is a place where we have a weekly conversation about all things midlife, and my intention for this podcast is to give you some ideas that are going to make you go, ooh, ah, yeah, I never thought of it that way. And to get you really excited about even the challenges that we go through during this time, because you know, a lot of the challenges that we go through in life are actually little gifts tied up in red, red bows. We often think that, you know, we don't want to have challenges. We don't want to have any problems. We don't want to go through this bit of pain, but there's usually gifts and great learning experiences attached to challenges and potential for a huge amount of growth. And that's what I love about midlife is that this is a time where we finally have on our big girl pants and we're ready to like stare down the barrel of any challenge gun and go, yeah, bring it. We're able to put out our best John Wayne act and go, yeah, cowboy, bring it on. So listen, before I get to today's podcast, let me do a little bit of business. I put a vid up on YouTube. It's my latest gray hair adventure. It's about a year and a half now of doing the whole gray hair thing. Um, my hair is way too long at this point in my life. I, I just I was looking at my hair this morning and I was thinking, you know what? I'm probably carrying around like five years worth of hair on my head. It's just time for a change. I want to I want to chop it off. I want to give it the chip chop. Uh, there's some really cool long bobs happening right now. So I think I'm going to go for the long bob. But the bottom line is in this episode of uh, the Gray Hair Adventure, I talk about the really bizarre reverse discrimination that can happen with this whole gray hair thing. And it occurred to me the other day, I was looking at the silver hair um, awesome goddesses on Pinterest, and I was remembering something that my hairdresser, who I fired when he told me that my hair was going to look like crap if I did the gray hair thing. I showed him the Pinterest page. I had my iPad tucked in my purse and I pulled out my iPad and I, and he was like so dead against me doing the gray hair thing. He just thought it was going to look horrible and blah, blah, blah. Uh, I tell the story in my first, very first episode of the gray hair adventure, which you can see on YouTube and I'll also put a link to it in the show notes. 
Anywho, I remember him looking. I'm showing him these pictures of um, all these awesome Cindy Joseph type models on the Pinterest pages just to try to give him an idea of what I was talking about because some people just need the education. They don't know what you're talking about. And everybody else who wasn't sure what I was talking about when I told them I wanted to go on the gray hair adventure, I would just show them one Pinterest page and they'd be like, yep, got it. Go for it, Susan. So I pull it out and I show it to my hairdresser and he automatically, and he was French, right? And he was like, bullshit, those are Photoshop. Those are lighting. Those are this, those are that. And I was like, nah. You know, I, so I kind of shut down at that point. But I have to say, when I was looking at my, um, I was looking at uh, the Pinterest pages the other day, and I was thinking of his words, and I was going, they are Photoshop, they are lighting, they are everything that when we look at our, compare ourselves to the pictures and magazines, compare ourselves to the pictures and magazines of bikini models or, you know, glossed over perfect skin celebrities, uh, that it, it's, I say 75% at least is the same thing going on with the whole gray hair um, movement. And it's funny, it took me a while, it's taken me a while to really, really get that, but it's absolutely true. It doesn't change my mind at all about the gray hair thing, but it does make me even more committed to knowing that this has to be a thing that is 100% right for you. So that's what I talk about in my, um, in my YouTube video th this week. So I'd love you to check it out. I'd love you to subscribe to my YouTube channel. I'm also putting my YouTube videos on my Facebook page if that helps um, eliminate any uh, traveling to other sites. Also, are you on my newsletter yet? Well, if not, come on, sister, get on my newsletter. I send out a, an, an email about every seven to ten days on just stuff that I only will talk about in email. They're usually little stories or inspirations, things that are happening in my life that I just want to share because even though I'm a coach, even though this is my business, helping women at midlife, I'm going through it too. I'm going through all of these things and I'm almost like, you know, I'm a, I'm a guinea pig trying this, trying that, just seeing what works on me. If it works on me or if it doesn't work on me, that's stuff that I want to share with you. And usually the first place that I'm going to share it is on the newsletter. So come on over to the changeguru.net and there's a little opt-in form on the side of the page fill in your deets. I never spam and I would love, love, love to connect with you. Now, speaking of my newsletter, um, I get emails from uh, people that subscribe to me and this one comes from Rosemary and she sent me a, a note um, that goes something like this because it leads to today's show. Uh, Hi, Susan. Insomnia and perimenopause. Now, that's a subject I'd like to learn more about. Why does it happen? When will it stop? Will life ever get back to normal? And how to cope in the meantime? Um, Rosemary, thanks so much for the question. It's a really good question. In fact, uh, the day that I got it, I think I'd been up all night long. And I had some really, I'd really been thinking about uh, insomnia and um, perimenopause and all this. So it was, it was awesome synchronic synchronicity to, to get your letter. And it was also cool because I had a, an epiphany about insomnia at this time of life that I never really had thought of or seen before. And then I'm going to share that with you in the podcast um, today. But let me, um, let me tell you, uh, let me just start with my story when it comes to insomnia. Insomnia is an old friend of mine. I've, I have encountered insomnia uh, in many parts of my life. I come from a family that experiences a lot of insomnia. Um, my parents uh, still, you know, have sleeping patterns that are pretty interesting and different, you know? So I grew up in, I kind of have, I have a lot of knowledge of people that have insomnia in my life. Now, the interesting thing, the reason why I want to mention that is it doesn't necessarily mean that it's genetic. Uh, it, you, you might have someone in your family or you might have a family of insomniacs and people might say, oh, you get that from your mother. Oh, you get that from your father. Oh, you get that from someone. But it, we, I like to think more of insomnia as a habit. 
rather than something that is going on with your body. And while there's some instances, I mean, I think that um, I, I wrote it down here with uh, regarding. Um, uh, where's my bloody notes, man? Yeah, 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 yeah. Look, I'm going to find it. Oh, I got it. Um, 45% of perimenopausal women have trouble sleeping. Okay, so it's a pre, you know, it's a relatively um half and half. Half women who go through perimenopause have insomnia. So we've got some hormonal stuff that makes uh, that makes us more um predisposed for going through this, but there are so many elements that keep us from having a decent night's sleep that to me point out the more you analyze them, the more you can see it's about habit and the way we approach sleep and the concept of sleep hygiene and how well we treat it. I recently went to a lecture by Ariana Huffington and um, she mentioned that sleep is completely undervalued and a lot of the really great thinkers of today like James Altucher, um, that they really, really believe in the importance of sleep. And that's such a weird concept to me because I always felt like I was a pussy uh, about feeling like I wanted to have sleep. Like the idea of needing a nap always kind of seemed, I always felt like maybe I was looked down upon by my colleagues. This is when I was in the really um, full-on working world during my career when I was um, in an office. And I would say, you know, I napped all weekend or something like that. And, you know, I just felt like I was um, a wimp for for needing sleep. Uh, working really super long hours and burning the candle at both ends in our society, at least in the time when I was in um, a corporate uh, situation, was really admired and prized. But the great minds are working out that you actually need um, some power snoozes, and you need to do what you can to sleep. I think that I also find the way that I treat sleep right now, whether I get a full night's sleep or whether I take a nap, I just feel like it's going to the gym in a way. I look at it as a lot of re restoration and rejuvenation for for my body. I don't abuse it. I don't um, sleep to sleep my problems away or to oversleep but i just really i can sense when i literally need a nap when i haven't got, when i've gone for some time with broken sleep patterns i it goes up priority on the priority food chain much like when you if you know that you're overeating or you're drinking too much alcohol or you're not exercising it's a self care kind of thing that's taken a long time to get to that stage so back to um your question rosemary is that i um uh, insomnia has always kind of been a, something that I've experienced through through my life, and especially in my um, in my forties when I was in that um, corporate environment, I would always have the worst night's sleep, and it would completely freak me out. And then um, when I was forty seven and started going through perimenopause. I could literally feel like adrenaline completely coursing through my, vein. you know, I just, it was like, like a chemical kind of feeling of being so awake. And I'd always wake up at three o'clock in the morning and I started to feel like, oh man, this is really insane because I'd have to, you know, be up for work at six thirty in the morning to start getting up ready to start my nine to five. And so it was, it was absolutely debilitating. The cool thing about it is that's what got me on this whole road of working with women at midlife because I'd get up in the middle of the night and I would literally do Google searches of what WTH, WTF is wrong with me. Why, why am I waking up every single night and just is so wired? I'm wired and I'm tired. What is going on with me? And I didn't even know it at the time, but I was going through starting to go through perimenopause and and even you know I'm 52 now and even five years ago perimenopause was something that is, was still was really super in the dark if you think people don't talk about it now let me tell you it's a hot topic now compared to what it was five years ago no one spoke about it and I discovered as I was googling that perimenopause is 
you know, is can be an instigator for insomnia. Now, the reason why, physical reason, and I'm not a doctor, but here's like the, here's the 101 sketch of why we are prone to insomnia perimenopause. You know how our hormones, where our hormones start getting all out of balance. So our estrogen, progesterone just is like, that's where we start getting very low on these things. But what happens is when we get lower on those things, our cortisol levels get higher and higher levels of cortisol just reduce, I think they reduce progesterone, but they just, what when more cortisol goes in your body, and cortisol is a stress hormone, so you know like when you they talk about fight or flight syndrome, fight, fight or flight, yeah, fight or flight, you know how that feeling is when someone, when you want to yell at someone or scream at someone, and you're, you're chest gets tight and all this energy, this anxiety, adrenaline courses through your veins, that's cortisol pumping through, making your adrenal glands work really super hard. And just during perimenopause, we're really susceptible to cortisol being released big time because our um, sex hormones like estrogen and uh, progesterone are are going lower and and just the, it's a perfect storm to make us wake up. So the cortisol surges make us wake up. And I think the lower um, estrogen and progesterone also play havoc with that. So the three of them together just form this um, crazy storm of making us wake up. Now, the reason why I don't necessarily think perimenopause is 100% part of the deal, the reason why I don't think it's a whole estrogen, progesterone, kind of what's happening in that regard when it comes to perimenopause deal with insomnia, because there's so many other elements happening to us during the age frame when we're in perimenopause. So for example, for me in my 40s, and right now I'm 52, so this this time, we're in our work cycle, we're in a really big um, upheaval cycle right now in our life where we're either, you know, in my 40s, I was in a corporate environment, working really hard, traveling really hard. Right now, I'm kind of, I'm self-employed and I'm in this really kind of creative space where I have to write and think and blah, 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 and do my business. So you're, we're in this, and I'm sure you can relate to this. If you're in your 40s and, and 50s, you're probably just in a cycle where you are thinking, you're going, you're burning the candle at both ends. You've got family commitments. You're trying to deal with your, your health and your life's purpose and all of that stuff. And then you've got your uh, your business as well, right? So we've got all these kind of things. And those things alone send cortisol through your body, the stress through your body that keeps us up at night. Let alone what it does to our consciousness. Our minds are just going all the time. We're always on our phone. We're always on the computer. If you work in social media, you're constantly connecting on a very, um, very mental level, very psychic level with people. All right. So we, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of, um, moving parts going on aside from perimenopause. It just happens to be a timing situation going on that makes us think that it's perimenopause. And also, if the statistics say that 45% of perimenopausal women experience insomnia, to me, that's not a slam dunk case that perimenopause is the main blame for insomnia. And I want to go back and say, I believe that a lot of insomnia is caused by our habits, the way that we go through the the habits that we go through the day, the habits that we use um, through the night. And I'm going to get to them more. But the first thing I want to say is if you are debilitated by insomnia, and the one thing I want to add my version of perimenopause might be completely different than your version of perimenopause. I really don't experience many symptoms at all um, right now at this stage. And I'm going to do um, some videos about what my perimenopause experience is like. I've already done some and I'll put links to them on the show notes for this episode. But really, the only thing that happens to me is I get a little bit of PMS, and um, then I get my period, 
and that's kind of it. I don't get really any hot flashes. I think I got one or two kind of sort of possible hot flashes, and I just made some lifestyle changes, and that didn't happen again, so I don't know if that's really even what it was or not, but I I just have very minimal um, perimenopausal symptoms. For some women that get hot flashes or night sweats, waking up, you know, in the middle of the night, sopping wet is debilitating. So if you have a really um, significant insomnia problems that you're pretty certain because of hot flashes, because of night sweats, just because it's not a normal situation for you, maybe in the past you've always slept really great until now that you're in perimenopause, um, you can get hormone help for that. So for some women, you can do um, bioidenticals, which is natural HRT. You can do, um, I guess, regular HRT. I know that that a thing, I think it's with bioidenticals, you can get um, pellet treatment, which sounds really interesting. Uh, There's progesterone creams. There's all kinds of ways to manage with some hormone help. And so... Um, talk to your um, open-minded doctor. You might have to go on a little bit of a treasure hunt to find the right person, but I highly suggest you check out uh, people like Dr. Northrup, um, Dr. Christian Northrup, who's at drnorthrup.com, or um, Sarah Gottfried, and I don't know her um, URL right now, but I'll, I'll put that on the show notes as well. Um, those women are leaders in the field of hormone health for women at midlife, and they will have some awesome um, hormone tips for dealing with insomnia and perimenopause. So that's one thing. The second thing is if you've got chronic insomnia, like you've got it bad, and it's making life just absolutely miserable. There's a lot of great studies that have come out from um, CBT, Cognitive Behavioral Behavioral Therapy, and that's the science that suggests that um, behaviors can be reprogrammed. It's the way the way you think is causing a behavior to happen or an action to happen. And there's a lot of great studies showing that um, getting some um, CBT, just going and getting some therapy with specialists who are trained in CBT and insomnia is really super helpful. So if you if you find you're one of those people, either you've got it it's so bad and you don't think it's ha- hormone related, it's something that's been going on your whole life, See a CBT um, trained therapist, uh, and I, I think you might have some luck with that. And I'll also put um, a, a link or two uh, to um, a CBT, some more information on that. So, if between hormone and CBT, um, there is there is relief. Now, I want to share with you five ways that I really have uh, managed my in- insomnia um, since going through perimenopause, and I am going to get to that little bit of an epiphany. But this is my this is my strategy, and you're going to see that um, the one thing the common deni- common denominator, the five. Um, tips that I'm going to give you. I'm literally going to take you through a whole day, like a 24-hour period of managing insomnia. But the one thing that all of these five tips have in common is that it's about mindset. So in the past, I might have used, when I've spoken about insomnia before, I might have spoken about beating insomnia or, you know, zapping insomnia or whatever. Um, Right now, I'm changing my language with it. I'm talking about um, living with it, loving it, accepting it. Um, it's I'm not fighting the fight of insomnia anymore or waking up. I accept now that every day in my life is a different day. And I think what helps me a lot have this kind of change of mindset are two things. One, I'm really... I'm focusing very hard on my language, on using positive, empowering language of of, um, challenging, limited, negative beliefs. And it doesn't mean like I walk around like Pollyanna thinking everything's fantastic. It just means that being positive in my thinking allows me more options where negativity tends tends to shut us down. 
so I'm embracing embracing the challenges rather than fighting them and pushing them away because it's the old um, the old saying what you pres- what you resist persists. The second thing that really helps me embrace insomnia and embrace the idea that every just because I have insomnia one day doesn't mean I'm going to have it the next day is that I live across the street from the beach and I'm constantly seeing how the ocean is completely affected by the cycle of the moon and I've always followed a moon cycle I always get my periods either around a new moon or a full moon you know it's only off by by a few days if it's ever off sometimes it's bang on that day and if our bodies are made of so much water it makes sense that we're affected in different ways depending on what the cycle of the moon's going. And I notice on certain moon days, my cat goes completely crazy. So you can kind of look to nature. I can, on full moon days, the tide is super high or, you know, you can just, you can just tell that something's going on with the way that the moon is. So I know that every day is going to be a different day and maybe it's purely natural it's a nature induced thing maybe it has to do with my hormones maybe it has to do with what's going on in my personal life maybe it has to do with what's going on in my work life maybe it has to do with how much physical exercise I've done maybe it has to do with what I've eaten what I've drank so you can see what I mean every day is a different thing and even the idea of thinking that my insomnia is not a daily occurrence for me gets me out of the habit of thinking that insomnia is a regular thing and getting and thinking and just taking it on a day by day basis actually releases less cortisol in my body than thinking oh my god i'm going to have insomnia for the rest of of my life so those are my two approaches that are probably going to reveal their beautiful little heads during the five tips so let's talk about my first tip, and this is really, before you even hit the sack, it's really about my whole day. And again, it's back to the idea of a lot of moving parts. I have to have a, a few things happen in my day, and this doesn't matter whether it's a full work day, it doesn't matter whether I'm traveling, whether it's a weekend, what, whatever is going on in my life. I've got to have a little, some rituals that promote wellness in in my life so it's about um moving my body i make sure i move my body it might only today it was only a half hour of um just a a walk and then i did about 15 minutes of, of yoga practice my my broken chicken wing was feeling a little bit uncomfortable today so i just really was very very light on it i shouldn't have said broken chicken wing my beautiful chicken wing, which I spoke about in the last podcast, was was just acting up a bit. So I just did, was very gentle on it, moving my body, eating eating really well. Um, I don't have any coffee really after two o'clock. I have an espresso, or maybe at the most I'll have a double espresso, and I don't have any caffeine after two o'clock, and that includes chocolate as well. I just really um, that. That's just, I have one cup of coffee and it has to happen before two o'clock. I make sure I take care of my mental health. You know, I'm journaling every day. I I have to tick a box of helping someone. I have to have tick a box of connecting with my family. I have to communicate. I've got to do my business. I love, I love my work. So just all doing all those things, just making sure I'm ticking all the boxes of of wellness every every single day i'm also eating a lot cleaner than i used to um and in uh, i'm eating foods that have a lot less preservatives a lot less um we're making a lot of our own food more than ever even we make our own almond milk now we're not eating any um any wheat we're not eating i haven't had dairy i miss cheese but i haven't had dairy for a long time um no refined sugar at all um i've really reduced my alcohol drinking so there's a lot of stuff a lot of stimulant 
type of foods that I'm not having anymore. And that really helps me out so, so much. So, and I do want to say that that kind of eating, um, the yogis call it, um, I think it's pronounced just off the top of my head, sattvic. You know, it's just food that doesn't stimulate you, food that's going to keep your mind and body and everything kind of sort of um, steady. So that's so all those different things. And, you know, sometimes I do things better than others. Sometimes not all of those boxes get ticked, but some of them do. So see, look at your life right now and see what's, what, what are you doing in your day to just look after yourself. And I know for me, when I was working um, for the man, I, it was really hard to nail down some of those things. I couldn't eat well. Um, I couldn't poop. Like, I hated pooping in an office. It was the worst thing in the world. So that didn't happen. Um, it was really hard for me to exercise well. Uh, I was just, you know, getting through the day. So maybe I didn't um, write in my journal like I should, you know, just all of those different things. And so it doesn't surprise me that I couldn't sleep at night. So look at the moving parts of your day and how much stuff are you doing during the day to support what's going to happen to you through the night. Now, come around uh, five o'clock, it's tools down time for me. This is really, really crucial. I find that working on computer uh, so much of my work is um, either online or on a computer. That's all there is to it. Uh, and that really makes my head uh, so busy, so fried, so everything as much as I love it. It really does a number on my brain. So I start consciously winding down um, around 5 o'clock. doesn't happen all the time. And um, when it can't happen all the time, I really have to look at how my day is going as far as time management goes. Uh, you know, if I don't start work until after 12 o'clock, then chances are I'm going to go past 5. But uh, so that's that's my big challenge. But I consciously start start winding down because just the communication tools really do a number on me. I know that. I absolutely do not go online, use the computer or anything after about 7.30 at the most. I re that's really even rare doing that. Uh, I won't, I would only answer the most emergency email from a family member um, after 6 p.m. Most of the emails I'll just deal with the next day. I don't do any of that kind of business. Um, I just, it's tools downtime. It's way, 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 way too stimulating for me. And this is a pretty tough thing for us to do in this society where we're supposed to be connected all the time. But I just really know that it stimulates my brain way, way, way too much. I get really way too wired and I just can't, it, it's just not compatible for me um, to have that much stimulation if I want to get a really good night's sleep. So that's what happens. The phone also, my computer is out, out of the bedroom. It's not in my, um, in my room at all. Pretty lucky right now because it's summertime. So we wake up with the sun and it's, it's usually, um, it's way before we have to get going for work. So that's really good but um you know you don't need an alarm clock for your phone but i just keep the there's no email checking in the middle of the night no email checking late at night i i almost look at it like um i've just reframe it in my brain that, that this is stuff that is i i don't i don't need it at that time okay so down the tools i also um we have some new rituals um my husband and i for our nighttime we will watch either a favorite show that we have taped. So we're not watching mindless television. We're not watching commercials. We're not watching um, news. We're not watching stuff that we don't 100% love. So we tape a lot of documentaries. We tape, um, we've got movies like Netflixy types of things waiting for us uh, or some favorite shows that we we follow and that's just kind of our one movie that we'll watch he'll come home we'll make dinner we'll talk we might sit outside he might go surfing I might read a book or something but it's just the least amount of device and then one one thing now we come to number two and that's the pre-bed ritual so just before I go on to number two get it 
it's like down tools time. The whole the whole day is just trying to find a balance in everything that you do. You're balancing your normal life and what you have to do with just some wellness in there. Two, pre-bed ritual. What works really well for me is if I've got a half hour to an hour to get into stuff. So I do my bathroom stuff, you know. It's just nice winding down, face wash, whatever. Um, nice smells. It might be taking some lavender and dabbing it behind my the back of my neck or putting it, lavender oil, putting it on my pillow, something like that. That. Um, Straightening up, uh, you know, just maybe reading, just winding my mind right down, gathering up. I gather up my bed things, so this is going to lead us to number three, but I have um, an old um, iPhone that doesn't work anymore and just only holds my podcasts on it or some audiobooks. So I make sure that's next to my bed and a face mask, you know, one of those things that you use on the plane to cover your cover your eyes. Those are my... Um, two things that I have next to my bed. They're kind of my, my bed things. Think about the clothes that you're wearing to bed. I sleep and I sleep butt naked. I don't like to wear clothes that's comfortable for, for me, but maybe you like really comfy clothes. Maybe it's time to invest in some beautiful, luscious, beautiful pajamas. If that's what you want, maybe it's time to invest in some really beautiful linen to have the best that you can afford. Uh, just the cleanest, most luscious stuff. I use bamboo sheets. They seem really comfortable for us right now. Just the most comfy, comfy bed that you can have. And so it's just all about creating this kind of sanctuary type of, of place where, where bed is a pleasure. Bled, bed isn't stressful. Bed isn't a dread. Bed is like, so even if you couldn't close your eyes, you'd be loving it because you're so, so, so super comfortable. I get a lot of inspiration when I stay in hotels of the kind of bed that um, feels so good to me. So, you know, when you're in a hotel, just have a look at how do they do the bedding? What what are the sheets that they use? What what are the kind of configurations that, of pillows? What kind of pillow do you like? All those kind of things give you clues of how to kind of, in your best way, replicate that kind of situation for your home. And then I do this little thing. Once I'm in the bed, all comfy with my husband, I go into this place, and this is a ritual that I've only picked up recently, but I really love it, and that is a Louise Hay, queen of Hay House ritual of really being thankful and having really extreme gratitude uh, for the day, um, for my life, for being in this position where I'm in bed, where I have shelter, where I have um, coziness, where I have safety, uh, where I'm going to have the, where I have the opportunity to have a rest. I just feel really, really grateful. I, and you know, Louise Hay even thanks, thanks her bed. I feel thankful. I feel thankful for my bed. So just going to this beautiful space of being gratitude, of being thankful, and I'll even, I'll even. Um, you know, I'll even predict how I'm going to feel. I'll think, you know, thank, thank you, bed. You're going to give me the best night's sleep tonight. I'm going to sleep really, really well tonight. I'm going to have beautiful dreams. I'm going to really just be so rested when I wake up. So just really planting these ideas and thought processes in my head. If you're not familiar with that kind of language or that kind of thought process, it's probably going to sound downright stupid and wacky to you. But for me, it really is, uh, well, let's put it this way. It's a lot more empowering and positive than saying I'm going to have a shitty night's sleep and I'm not going to feel good. So that's that really works for me. The third thing is what happens when you wake up in the middle of the night, okay? So when I wake up in the middle of the night... I'll either get this feeling like I can go back to sleep really easily. And generally also, when I wake up in the middle of the night, it often is because I have to pee. So I've found that if I reduce my um, my liquid consumption, you know, from about 5 o'clock on, I do all my water drinking before then. Uh, my big mistake sometimes is that I realize I haven't drank much water and then I just do, you know, guzzle. It too, way too late in the day. So 
I've found that by just drinking a lot lighter at night is so helpful to me as far as having to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night. So I often, that's usually the trigger for me to, to wake up is having to, having to pee. So I'll go to the toilet, then I'll come back, and then I'll either know that I can go back to sleep or I can't. I just kind of know. So what I do is if I feel like, okay, I'm kind of in this twilight zone, I don't know if I can sleep or not, I'll take my headphones, my trusty headphones, I'll put them in, and I'll put a, a podcast in. And I will, put, generally, I like to listen to um, Joe Rogan is one of my favorites. I'll put a link. His his podcasts are like three hours long, and they're just purely a conversation. And I tend to, after 20 minutes or so, just drift off to sleep. Uh, I do that also with um, books on tape. And for some reason, I think I've mentioned this before, but for some reason, Roseanne Barr's um, Roseanne Archie book, um, that one, I love that book so much, and I but I am knocked out after just like a chapter of it. So you might have to experiment a little bit of what is the um, podcast or audiobook that helps you fall asleep, but those seem to do the trick really, really well. If I can't, um, if I have that in and I, and what also helps too is even if I can't sleep, it just kind of chills me out. It just kind of relaxes me to just listen to something. And also, by the way, also um, when things are really bad, and I especially use these when I'm traveling, I'll keep my um, my eye shades on the whole time. That is a really, really helpful tool, tool for keeping me rested. The important thing about keeping a rested, peaceful feeling when you wake up in the middle of the night, and here's the big irony, and here's why it is such a habit, this whole insomnia thing, is that when you wake up in the middle of the night, if it's a chronic problem, or you might go into this ritual of going, damn it, I'm waking up, I have to be up in three hours, I'm going to feel so crappy today, I'm you know, you get all these negative feelings. And what happens when you get negative feelings? The cortisol runs through you. And then it just sets up this debilitating feeling. So even the idea of waking up at three o'clock in the morning and your thought process is a habit. So what I like to do is I, if I wake up and I can feel that I'm woken up, well, I'm more woken up, I'm not going to fall back to sleep rather than dread. I just kind of reframe it as, okay, I'm just going to rest and listen to um, my podcast. I'm going to, I'm just going to rest and relax and enjoy the, this quiet moment to just chill out and to rest in a different way. You know, maybe I'm only going to go into a little, have a little bit of a alpha sleep or whatever. You know, maybe I'm not going to go all the way into deep sleep. But I'm just going to rest my eyes. It's going to be beautiful. So just reframing that feeling from an oh my God, no, not again kind of thing to like, hey, it's completely cool. I'm going to be fine kind of feeling is really big for breaking the negative habit that sends cortisol through your body, you know, alerts you, gets you into that, um, you know, takeoff mode of, of needing to take action mode. It just is a bit of a chill out. Now, number um, four here is if I really, really, really can't sleep, I'll get out of bed. I don't get out of bed at first um, first first time of, of waking up. And that's because even getting out of bed immediately can be habitual. So I just rest. If I can't, if I cannot sleep at all, and you know that feeling, I will get up. I'll get cozy. I'll put on my cozy um, bathrobe. I've got this really comfy um, bathrobe. And I will sometimes, and the and a lot of places don't mention this, but I'll ask myself, okay, am I hungry? Do I want a little bite to eat? And I might make something that's just going to fill my tummy just a little bit, a little bit of comfort food, something healthy. Last night I woke up in the middle of the night. I couldn't sleep, and so I made myself, I had some uh, lentil, like a heavy lentil soup. I made myself a little bowl of soup. Yum. Okay. And it just filled that little hole. And then I will, I have a bank of either 
a movie that I can watch, a, not a scary movie, but like usually it's like a chick flick or yeah, it's generally a chick flick or an old movie that I've seen a million times and something that's an hour, two hours long. And I will just let myself enjoy that. But lately, I've been having really awesome, getting really awesome books, like real books, not Kindle books, real paper books. Oh my God, what a concept. And I've been loving just reading real books in the middle of the night. And between those two things, and it's just kind of like letting myself indulge in the silence of middle of the night. You know, it's actually a beautiful, beautiful time of, of night. And I'll do those two things. Now, the night that I got Rosemary's email, the night, the night before I got Rosemary's email, when I said that I woke up and I had the epiphany that I was telling you about, I had been really, have been suffering massive writer's block. I mean, I say suffering because having writer's block as a writer can really mess with my head and I just knew that I needed to um to do stuff and I and I could feel it building and building and building and it was really weighing heavy on my mind and I woke up in the middle of the night and it was like something told me you know Susan you need to get up and you need to to write you need to work on a, a project a side project that I'm working on and I got up and I started working on it and it was almost, it blo- it completely unblocked my writer's block. And it hit me that I think that possibly our insomnia at midlife can be unexpressed creativity. Now, I know that might sound like what the to some of you, but for me, that really rang true. And it's, it, so let me say it again. Insomnia at midlife can possibly represent something that's unexpressed, an unexpressed need to communicate, an unexpressed need to be creative. And the reason why I believe this, because this is what got me to go on this whole path of writing books, of going back to school, of making videos, of doing podcasts. It was that voice in my head when I was 47 years old that said, you know, start Googling, get up in the middle. That voice in my head when I was 47 years old and waking up at three o'clock in the morning, it was that voice that said, start Googling and see what midlife is. Start writing and expressing your feelings, expressing what's going on with you. And perhaps at that time, I didn't tie in the idea that insomnia is almost like this awesome tool That is like giving us a nudge as in wake up, wake up, do something with your life, change your life. And until that the night before I got Rosemary's note and it was like, wake up, wake up and do this thing that you need to do. But I but because right now I'm so sensitive to everything and looking for the reasons behind why we why we do things it rem- it made me go whoa what if our insomnia is actually our body our our metaphysical body's way of saying hey deal with this thing deal with this thing right now and it reminds me a lot of when my kids were little and the times when they couldn't sleep you know this is like before they were 2 years old the times where they had the most trouble sleeping were the times when they were going through their biggest growth development you know if they were cutting a tooth or if they were learning how to crawl or learning how to walk or talking more or something, it always tied into times where they would sleep really bad, have very broken sleep. So I love the idea that insomnia might be trying actually to give you a message of something that needs to be birthed, something, some type of growth development that's happening in your life. And the the first thing I can say is get up. You know, if if insomnia is really bothering you so much, and of course, take advantage of the idea of getting some hormonal help if you need it and going down that path, 
or getting, you know, looking into CBT or whatever, but also look into the idea of what do you need to express? What do you need to do? Get up and, and write. Get up and paint. Get up and write a poem. Get up and knit. Get up and do something and take advantage of the beautiful, still quietness where all you can do is hear yourself think. It's so different than any other time during the day. We have so much stimulation, we don't even realize how much stuff is going on until you are literally alone with your thoughts in the quietest, quietest of the night. And that's why I say, don't go online, don't whatever, if you can help it, especially if you're a writer. But it's amazing what happens when you're alone with your thoughts. This might be the time it's going to reveal a very, very profound message. Last tip. Long podcast, right? But I, oh, I'm trusting that, that if you're going through insomnia, this is really giving you some gold. Now, the last tip, number five. Whatever your sleep was the night before, wake up with gratitude. Wake up with gratitude. It's another day. It's another amazing day that you've never had before that is going to be full of surprises. And maybe things are going to happen that you never expected. It's a brand new day, a chance to start all over again. And if you've been up all night, eh, you might be tired. If you can, catch a nap if you can. You'll be okay. But wake up with gratitude. Thank. And this is, again, it's kind of like retraining your habit. Instead of waking up and going, oh, shit, I had the worst sleep. It's a way of waking up and going, thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm thankful for the sleep that I did have. I'm thankful for my beautiful bed. I'm thankful for having the chance to experience a brand new day and then do some gentle movement. So for me, even though, you know, like last night I didn't have um, the best sleep in the world, but I did have my beautiful lentil soup is I, even though I felt tired, I didn't really want to do it. To be honest with you, I went and I went for a, I did my yoga practice, very brief one. And I went for a half hour walk and I've got some movement going. And I'll tell you that bought me energy. That bought me energy just the way a cup of coffee, you you know, gives you probably 20 minutes of energy or gives you time to keep on going. For me, if I get some gentle movement going, get blood moving through my um, body, get those happy hormones going, it goes a long way to keeping me going even when I haven't slept that well, which was like, you know, last night. And here I am, it's probably three or four o'clock in the afternoon and, and I'm still here and I'm going. So That is, I guess, the main thing that you can take away from this. There's a lot of, as I say, moving parts. There's a lot of habit stuff going on, whether it's how you deal with your day, how you deal with your night, how you deal with when you wake up in the middle of the night. A lot of different areas to look at. And if you want to take this to the next level and really examine, I've got a free wellness journal on my website. All you have to do is go to the changeguru.net and sign up for my newsletter and you get this free download. And what it does is you track every single day for 30 days of your physical, spiritual, emotional, mental health. In addition to tracking when the full moon and the new moon is. And so for your physical health, for example, you would write how you sleep. And you can see there when the moon is. You can know from tracking your physical health, you can know if you if having premenstrual tension, premenstrual syndrome makes you more um prone to being having insomnia. You can track your mental health to know that how's your work life going? Do you have a lot of stuff that you need to deal with? Is that keeping you up all night? How's your spiritual health? Are you taking care of your soul? You know, and is is that something that needs balance? So it actually helps you find the sweet spot or just like start working towards the sweet spot to have all these moving parts going. And that in turn, the theory is that in turn is going to help you manage embrace insomnia. So that's an awesome way to start getting on top. And I know it probably seems like so much, so much work, but man, we just, des- we, we deserve the opportunity to feel as good as we can. And 
I think that uh, it might seem like work, but when you are getting on top of all these things, your life just flows better. Insomnia doesn't seem to be the the big hairy monster thing that it, you might it might be if you're not looking after your soul, if you're not looking after your emotional health, if you're not looking at your mental and physical health. When we can get all these other things going, life seems better. And then, th- you know, inconveniences like not being able to sleep in the middle of the night, they take on a lesser intensity because you're managing things, you're balancing things a lot better. So those are, you know, the five tips that I've got for dealing with insomnia. You know, I really look through your whole day and down tools of five o'clock, whatever winds you up, wind it back down to have your good pre-read pre-bed ritual of what you need just in case you wake up what you need to settle in three how are you going to deal with waking up in the middle of the night what's your mindset going to be you're going to reframe it from rather than dread to like okay it's all cool i'm fine i'm resting four if you can't sleep do you have some unexpressed creativity going on what is your body trying to tell you and five waking up with gratitude and gentle movement these are all awesome tips i'm so excited that i got to share them with you now if you got value out of this podcast here's how you can help me you can rate me on itunes give me an uh, give me an honest review on iTunes that will help me out so much it'll just help share what i'm doing with others that are really into podcast you can share this with your network so if you're watching this on youtube share it on your um on your facebook page and your on your um google on your g plus thingamajigger whatever uh, you can share on twitter all that kind of stuff and come on over and sign up for my newsletter that would be awesome too i'd love you to be on my list all right that's enough long podcast hey have a beautiful beautiful night's sleep i think that you are going to sleep really really good tonight you're going to really enjoy um enjoy this evening thank you so much for listening i really appreciate it and i look forward to talking with you next time bye for now